Okay, so now that we've arrived at a new expression for our Lorentz boost matrix, let's just first of all verify that this still is a Lorentz transformation. Of course it is going to be, but let's just check just to be 100% sure. So if you remember, we had our conditions, we've got one of them here, and then we also had to have that the determinant of this lambda is plus or minus one, and that also this lambda is now a linear matrix, it doesn't depend on the coordinates. So let's first check the determinant, just calculate the determinant, we're going to find gamma squared minus gamma squared b squared and c squared. So if I just factorise gamma, and then just simply using the definition of gamma, we can see that this expression is just always going to be 1. So our determinant is plus 1, as expected. Now we need to check now the matrix version of this expression, which was that, uh, that the metric is invariant when we multiply by this lambda transpose which is just the matrix version of this tensor expression here. So, just quickly run through this calculation. I'll just first write lambda transpose, which is just the same thing as lambda. And then, when we multiply the metric times lambda, what that's going to do is essentially just put a minus sign on this first column. And so, e to lambda is going to be Okay, and now to save myself writing all of this out, we can just realise that, well, if we just do now one of the terms, so let's look at the, the zero, zero term, which we know needs to be minus one, we're going to have this row times this column, so we're going to have a plus gamma squared, and then a plus gamma squared V of C which I'll just write up here quickly. And then again, just factorize the gamma and use the definition of the Lorentz factor. And you'll find that this whole thing, well, it's minus one. So the first term is just gonna be a minus one. And then the off diagonal terms are just gonna simply cancel because we simply have gamma squared v over c and then a minus gamma squared v over c and so I won't bother showing you but you can easily convince yourself that this is going to again result in our Minkowski metric. Okay now to check our final condition you remember we had to have that this lambda is now a linear matrix i.e. it doesn't depend in any way on our coordinates such that the derivative with respect to any of our coordinates of the lambda matrix is just zero. And so now if we look at our lambda matrix, on the face of things, we don't have any dependence on coordinates, but now one thing we need to realize is that this V does actually now depend on our coordinates because V is just the coordinate velocity. And so both this gamma and the V are looking like they are somehow dependent on coordinates and that this could be a non-linear transformation. But now what we essentially need to realize is that, well, whilst we do have this coordinate dependence, we need to instead realize that this condition is going to be true, that the derivative of any of these lambda matrix components is always going to have to be zero and now we can realize this condition is going to restrict what now this velocity can actually be. So just simply if we realize that now the derivative of any lambda matrix component has to be zero, let's just consider one possible so let's just look at this term, say, the derivative of minus gamma v of c. So we know that v is dx by dt, 
So when we perform these derivatives, we're going to get some terms that look like this. So we're going to have a... Now I'll start writing the over C on the gamma. So we're going to have a derivative with respect to time of this velocity. And then we're going to have a gamma over C. And then a spatial derivative of our velocity. And we know that this whole thing has to be equal to zero by this constraint. And now, to give myself a little bit more room, I'll rub out this over here. Now, looking at these expressions, we can realize that this is going to be, have to be equal to this. So, first of all, we can cancel the gamma over c squared, and we're just going to find this following condition. And now, if we realize again that this v is a dx by dt, we can rewrite this as now the second derivative of x, which is going to have to be equal to this. Now it's going to be a mixed partial derivative. So when I wrote this second partial derivative, this should have been a partial, but because it's a, a total derivative, I can just write it as d's. But now we need to realize because we know that these mixed partial derivatives are going to commute, we can essentially take them in any order that we like. So I can write this mixed partial now as the partial derivative with respect to t of the partial derivative of x with respect to x. And that whole thing, this is just going to be a constant, just one. And so the derivative with respect to t is going to be zero. And now we realize this condition on our Lorentz transformation is essentially now the statement that this second derivative of x with respect to t has to be zero. Okay, so now we can realize what this condition is really saying. We know that dx by dt is just the velocity. So this condition here is basically saying that our well, from classical mechanics, we can identify that this second derivative of position with respect to time, this is the acceleration, or the rate of change of velocity. And so what this is now telling us is that when we perform a Lorentz boost, we have to always boost to a moving frame, but that frame can't accelerate. That frame has to be moving with a constant velocity. So when you perform a Lorentz boost, you're simply going from a stationary observer to now an observer that moves with a constant velocity, i.e. the observer isn't accelerating away from you. And now we should be really careful. This doesn't mean that things can't accelerate. We can have acceleration and we can deal with it in special relativity. But what we would then realize is that the transformation from a stationary observer into now an accelerating reference frame is not going to be a Lorentz transformation. And that's going to be something quite crucial and fundamental that's going to go into how we generalize things to general relativity. But what we need to realize right now is that Lorentz transformations can only transform between, now this is the terminology that we use, we call these reference frames inertial reference frames, i.e. they're reference frames that are stationary or moving relative to one another with a constant or fixed velocity. There's no acceleration between the frames because as we're going to see, acceleration is somehow quite deeply connected with the force of gravity. But in special relativity, we only ever deal with inertial reference frames, which are not accelerating relative to one another, at least. And we use these linear Lorentz transformations to transform between these relatively moving frames. Okay, so in summary then, we've first of all gone through and derived a slightly more concise expression for our Lorentz transformation, where we were able to realise that this gamma, the Lorentz factor, is this thing which we introduced into the Lorentz boost, this cosh of our rapidity parameter, and so we rewrote re re the boost matrix in a slightly more sort of 
easy to digest way. And then we went through and just double checked that this still is a Lorentz transformation, as of course we would expect it to be. And then we were able to realize something slightly more about how this condition is going to affect the kind of transformation that we can do. And as we've seen, we're only allowed to transform between uh, reference frames that move with a fixed constant velocity between reference frames. We can't perform a Lorentz transformation that's going to take us into a, an accelerating reference frame because then it would be a non-linear transformation.